I don't know if I need it. Excuse me. Can you use your phone at all? Oh, do you mind I'm you with me now? You can you time? I don't know. It's okay, Tab, I use the time. Tabs one six. Respected panel, over the course of my speech, I will talk to you about certain moral obligations that have to be placed on liberal states. And then I will go ahead and talk to you about what exists and what is the nature of the limitations on freedom of speech and expression in authoritarian governments and as to how this can bring out real and very effective change. Right? Let's first try and understand what are the kind of principles that we're talking about and that we associate with liberal governments. Like we believe that the freedom of speech and expression is fundamental to any liberal state and we believe that is paramount. Like this means that every individual within that country has the right to dissent, that there is a scope for personal autonomy, that there is the, the right to self-determination in what we're meaning is that the people have a right in the manner in which the government chooses to regulate. Right? We also believe that there is scope for due process. These are the basic principles on which a liberal state should function and has always functioned. Right? Now let's try and understand as to how in parallel authoritarian states function and as to why their limitation of freedom of speech and expression is like a lamin. Right? They believe in complete control over the dissemination of all forms of information. We're talking about internet, we're, we're talking about print media, we're talking about like stifling of all, all sorts and all forms of dissent against this authoritarian state. We believe that this will go ahead and restrict all forms of foreign media from going ahead and publishing anything with respect to this government and the same being published and read by its citizens within this particular authoritarian state. Now let's try and understand so why we're debating this particular motion. Like we on like opening government believe that all other forms of like intervention of these liberal of these liberal countries have failed. And like how do we tell you this? We tell you that in terms of like Iran and Iraq, in terms of like how America has gone ahead and tried to to try to go ahead and liberalize the world through what has failed and we believe that that is in the context in which we're debating. Yeah. We believe that there is a need to go ahead and like pursue other alternative forms through which we can go ahead. I will take you fifth minutes. Sir. We can go ahead and pursue forms of like change within these countries and we believe that hacking the these inst and funding the hacking of these institutions within these countries that limit freedom of speech is the way to go. And why do we think this is the case? We believe that when you go ahead and like hack these institutions that go ahead and limit freedom of speech and expression, we believe at that point you're giving power back to the citizens. You're going to go ahead and make the government engage with certain hard truths. I will take you to the fifth minute, sir. You make you go ahead and engage with these truths. It will result in the gov in, in these citizens being able to read exactly what this state is going to has has been doing and is doing, and it will then force the state to engage with the kind of discourse that comes out of this free freedom of speech uh, scenario. Right? We believe that's paramount and important in any sort of a country that that wants to run, and we believe that this is fundamental to the social contract as well. Right? We believe the point at which you've given up certain rights of yours to the state and for the state to go ahead and protect your rights, we believe you expect the right, uh, the, the states to give you that uh, a certain degree of rights and we believe the freedom of speech and expression is fundamental to the kind of rights that the state must guarantee to you and at which point the state refuses to do that, it's violating the social contract and does not require and, and is required to be landed. Right? We believe that, uh, not, not yet sir, we believe that we believe that the manner in which this happens is like two. Right? Firstly, we believe that these liberal states have a moral obligation by virtue of the kind of principles that they are based on. Like the constitution of these countries are based on these liberal principles. Right? We believe that the constitution of India, the constitution of America are all based on these liberal principles of freedom of speech and expression being like one of the most fundamental of them. And like it is, it is, and it is your moral obligation by virtue of being a liberal state to go ahead and ensure that other citizens in other countries do not are are, are not like deprived of these fundamental inalienable rights, right? That is your moral obligation. Now, considering the fact that you cannot go ahead and violate and blatantly violate the sovereignty and like go ahead and destroy institutions and cause mass destruction and deaths of individuals within this particular country through like means of what we believe that this alternative is the most effect effective and most efficient. Right? We believe that we will go ahead and fund institutions that are in in its nature objective. Right? And what do we talk about? Right? What do we mean by these institutions? We refer to institutions like WikiLeaks. 
these are these these are institutions or organizations that have actively gone ahead and like leaked uh, or, or have gone ahead and like in, and hacked into like government databases and ensure that citizens get to know like the the secrets uh, as to what these countries are up to and whether the state is imposing like arbitrary sanctions on them right we believe that this is the best organization to go ahead and do this because you you this is not like a, uh, it's not like they're biased or any sort right they will go ahead and hack america if it starts by its freedom of speech and expression they will also hack like countries like vietnam sudan uh, uh, sudan and all these other countries that go ahead and actively like violate uh, your freedom of speech and expression yes yeah, so don't shirk your word in this debate it's not about funding wikileaks it's about you as america actively hacking china's infrastructure defend that Right. So I've told you about the moral obligation that you have. Right. You have moral obligation by virtue of you have of you being a liberal country. Right. And I've also told you as to how all other means of you achieving this have failed. We've told you countless number of times as to how the point in which you go ahead and attack this country, and that that seems to be the only alternative in status quo. Right. The only other measure through which you've gone ahead and tried to effectuate change is through war and is through actively invading these countries. We believe the point at which you've done that you've gone ahead and created mass destruction, and you've not enabled the individuals within that country to fully realize their power. And we, how do we see this? We see the example of this in like Iran and Iraq, wherein these autocratic uh, regime keep coming, irrespective of the number of times you keep invading. We also believe that the point at which the Tunisian, we believe that the Arab Spring becomes a good example here. Right? We believe the Arab Spring was started because of a Tunisian man who set fire to himself. Yeah, yeah. We believe that the reports of this man, like going ahead and like doing emulating himself, and the videos of that being shared all across the Middle East, started this change, started a process of mobilization, and which which resulted in individuals like going ahead overthrowing these authoritarian governments that had denied for so long their fundamental rights. We believe this is what will happen. In status quo, when we do not like actively invade these individuals, but like hack these institutions and allow these individuals discourse. This is to say, you will allow for information to be disseminated to these individuals. We're talking about as to how this information, the nature of this information. That is to say, I will get to know what my government is spending on. I will get to know what my government plans to do with respect to defense. It will. I will get to know as to why they do the kind of things they do, and as to why I am not allowed to say the things that I need to say. And I believe, that, and we believe, on opening government, that this is the most important thing. Like you, the the, uh, the burden on side opposition here is to show me that in spite of all your moral obligations that you have as a liberal state, in spite of all of these obligations, when you, how can you still like watch and like let these uh, atrocities be committed with respect to like denial of freedom of speech and expression we believe that the burden on them is to go ahead and prove as to how that you can shirk off your uh, responsibilities because just because they're like a, another nation into itself and you should not interfere we believe that problematic and for all those reasons we're very very proud to propose thank you we thank the previous speaker very much and happy call on the leader of opposition Mr. Speaker, we agree with side opening government that, to a large extent, a moral obligation does exist on liberal countries to go ahead and liberate people in these countries where there is an authoritarian regime. Right? But we disagree on their mechanism. Notice that throughout their uh, PM speech, what they said was that the mechanism of warfare and intervening openly in another country is incorrect. But what we tell you is that there's, a, like, there's pretty much a parallel between what they're doing and uh, what they uh, and warfare, right? Because notice that things like uh, attacking infrastructure and hacking and things like that are also effectively an attack on the sovereignty of that particular nation. We think that hacking largely falls under the same umbrella in which you would place, say, dismantling electrical grids, attacking water supply of a particular country. Both of those things are akin to warfare and we think that the outcomes of both are pretty similar in that that country will become isolated from the rest of the liberal world, which we do not want from our side of the house. 
and before I move on, just a clarification that look, the Arab Spring happened at a time where people didn't understand the power of social media, right? And we think that in this particular circumstance, the authoritarian regimes are going to be even tighter on their infrastructure, which makes it extremely, extremely difficult to hack in the first place. So we don't think that it's going to be as easy as they came. But even if it is, we think there are multiple harms that come out of it, which I will illustrate throughout my speech. First argument. We think that it creates a world where hacking becomes the method of engaging with another country, right? Notice that on their side of the house, they consider this kind of hacking to be extremely ethical, right? Because that's the way that they would view it in their own country. But the way in which it would be viewed in a country that is being attacked is that look, they, they hacked us, we can hack them as well. We think that this leads to consequences um, like uh, essentially legitimizing the kind of interference that Russia carried out on the US, right? It legitimizes any kind of social, uh, like uh, interference that China would pull off on the US uh, simply because hacking has now become ethical and no one can call you out on it because even the liberal nations are in on it, right? We think at a point of time where it becomes the norm to attack another country's uh, software infrastructure, we think that there is uh, there is no means by which you can call them out for breaching the sovereignty of your country and for breaching the kind of like uh, say electoral process or social media hacking that Russia did in the first place right you have no moral upper hand in those particular circumstances which you would need in order to actually bring these issues to the fore on platforms like the UN we think that that power goes away completely and that's extremely harmful because ultimately it becomes a race of who has the better IT infrastructure right secondly we think that Diplomatic ties are useful and must be leveraged as the alternative, right? We think that uh, unlike what they think on their side of the house where it's either war or attacking software infrastructure, we think that there are alternatives, right? We think that diplomatic ties with countries who do have unfavorable value systems according to us have worked even though they have been slow, right? We think that trade with Saudi Arabia has largely helped in the situation of women in that particular country, right? We think that in those particular circumstances, simply having those discussions with the people in that country saying that these are the restrictions you need to remove in order to carry on trade with us are extremely useful because it gives you some kind of leverage, right? Second, another example is when Turkey necessarily wanted to join the EU, right? We think that in that particular circumstance, the rest of the uh, EU demanded that Turkey remove some restrictions on freedom of speech in order to allow uh, Turkey to join the EU in the first place, right? And thirdly, we think that even in countries like Pakistan, the US aided things like agriculture at the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan in exchange for a reduction in violence in those particular places. We think that diplomatic ties work and they work even in countries where uh, the authoritarian regimes are getting stricter and stricter, right? And we think that that's a valuable alternative. Thirdly, we think that, okay, before that, can I get a POI from closing? Why are these two models? Why are these two models that model that you are proposing and the model that we are proposing mutually be exclusive? Exactly, right? Notice that the amount of funding that would go in, like this this motion is obviously about funding this kind of infrastructure, right? There's only a certain amount of funding that you would put into saving other people in other nations. It's not a limitless amount. So it either has to be in the form of like setting up schools and stuff in these kinds of areas and carrying on diplomatic ties, or it has to be in the form of funding this kind of ethical hack hacking. Please don't pretend like it's like a bottomless pit of money that you have on your side, that you can carry out any kind of like help to these people um, like uh, unconditionally, right? Which brings me to my third point, right? We think that these kinds of nations will be completely isolated and it leads to a far, far worse outcome on their side of the house. We think that the kind of money that's allocated for helping these countries, whether it goes into aid, which could be in the form of setting up agriculture, it could be in the form of setting up infrastructure in terms of schools in these areas. We think that those would necessarily have to come to an end if you want to uh, like pump in money into this kind of hacking infrastructure, right? Into hacking this kind of infrastructure, right? We think that at that particular point in time, you lose out on the amount of funding that you could put into aid to these countries. Secondly, we think that as soon as you like infiltrate these kinds of systems through hacking and if like, uh, and I'm pretty sure these countries will be able to tell if there's like a breach in their software system, we think that at that particular point, discussion with these countries on diplomatic ends will necessarily come to a halt, right? And we think that this leads to isolation of these countries 
from uh, from liberal countries on the whole uh, as well right because we think that as soon as you attack a country's sovereignty the way that you're doing now we think that those countries will necessarily become aggressive towards you as well right there's no need for them to engage with you on on a diplomatic front if they've already seen that you have essentially attacked their infrastructure right we think that at, at that particular time it's almost impossible to go back on the kind of like move that you have taken it's not possible to say oh i'm sorry i hacked your infrastructure and then go back to performing diplomatic ties we think that that necessarily leads to any kind of contact between these authoritarian countries and liberal countries engaging in any kind of like uh, like political discussion right and we think that that leads to huger harms we think that there is no longer any purview or any kind of check on this country that exists that you would have if you had diplomatic ties in the first place loss of these kinds of diplomatic ties means that you no longer have the kind of oversight that you used to as a country when you used to have constant discussions with them when your diplomats would fly into those countries see what's going on in those particular countries and report back we think all of that comes to an end on their side of the house as soon as you attack another country in the way that they're doing we think the diplomatic ties on our side of the house are the way to go right because um on their side of the house we see that these uh, individuals are likely to clamp down even further on the kinds of like infrastructure they have and uh, clamp down on the people that they uh, people that that they govern in the first place right because they want to make sure that the it hack doesn't affect the people the way that they never wanted it to right and for all those reasons i'm extremely proud to oppose we thank the previous speaker very much and are happy to call the deputy prime minister panel if the, if the side opposition agrees that these values are core principle values of liberal democracies and that these values are cherished and must also be spread in the in a right manner and must also be disseminated and they believe that every citizen of any country wherever he lives has a right to live under a society that america lives in or say britain lives in or say india lives in if that is conceded then this question then this debate becomes one about the means by which you enforce those values right we are say from the very beginning that what we are proposing is the absolutely correct means by which to go about why do we say so because all the other means that have been that have been tried before have miserably failed and what has that meant is that that people have come to attack not just the means but also the value so for example when you overthrow actively a saddam hussein from iraq there is some sort of a political crisis there is a political vacuum and isis gets hold of it and then isis creates terrorists and then you say that well, well you know what america really created isis there was this political capital what then happens is that the core principle value of democracy and human rights also takes a hit because the means by which you enforce have been completely unpopular what we are essentially saying is that we are moving away from that paradigm and we are reinforcing the people's very own right for self determination because what we are saying is that we will only provide you with sufficient information the decision making capacity still rests with you what what are the institutions you want what are the country, what are the leaders you want what are the kind of government you want what are the decisions that you will be made is going to be still dependent on people and that is very different that is a very important difference between the uh, liberal democracy overhanding and sort of using its muscular power to say this is how you must live versus to say that people must have a right to self determination and that are, and, and that any information barrier restricts people from doing that now side opposition side uh, uh, opposition's argument to this is that listen hacking is also a means of sort of violating sovereignty right that how are you running behind that hacking somehow does not mean uh, that you're not violating sovereignty well so does having armies right let's not pretend the fact that hacking is suddenly being invented or that other countries don't hack into other countries it is a reality and we live in that reality just like you are saying oh every solution can be have a diplomatic effect well you won't require an army for that right understand that your cyber warfare today has become a part of your army has become a part of you to exercise your muscle power the question then becomes when do you exercise that power and are there any objective reasons 
for which you exercise those powers. We believe that these are the objective reasons that we are fighting for. The fact that we are saying that if there is an authoritarian government and the fact that we can actively fund an organization that goes against and blocks these hindrances because then that becomes an objective standard. We are no longer having proxy wars and planning coups and assassinations. What we are essentially saying is that, listen, here is the barometer, here is the benchmark, here is when we start using this and therefore it becomes very critical in that particular debate because then the entire international community can look at you and say that, okay, this is the objective standard you had that you had set. A, are you fulfilling it at, at, at home or B, have you made that particular objective standard to use that kind of power and therefore that is what we believe that we are no longer sort of operating under a certain, certain pretense. We make sure that our standards are objective. We make sure that if we are violating sovereignty because we do not think that sovereignty is complete immunity to do anything. If we believe that we are violating sovereignty, we lay down international standards and we believe only when these standards are met will we have will we go ahead and do these particular things, right? So these, why do these diplomatic solutions as the other sort of means by which uh, the side opposition says that you can pursue, go ahead, pursue diplomatic means? We, I see absolutely no connection. Well, how by sheer diplomatic means, of authoritarian government will suddenly become a liberal democracy? Are we going to say that suddenly by putting some sanctions on China or by simply saying that uh, North Korea must have this, that they suddenly sort of change its structure of power? I don't think that structure power or government change based on diplomatic power, but they actively change when citizens from within that country decide that that government has to change. We do not believe that diplomatic power can ever solve those critical issues because we do not believe that it creates enough of a burden for the government to change. We believe that that burden always comes from the very people who live in that citizens, right? When we, we, we in fact believe that if you put sanctions and if you sort of pressurize these troops, what happens is that these authoritarian governments become even more stricter, they become even more dead and they become even more make, making sure that even more sufficient sanctions are implemented within their own people. And therefore the community and the average citizen living in those authoritarian government who suffers and it creates absolutely no deterrence at the top level. Yes sir. So if you create sanctions and like people, the authoritarian dictators clamp down even more, in the same way if you hack a certain administrative like sector, they just have, they just clamp down even more. Like why, why doesn't it happen in your world? Because we're not saying it's a one step process, right? The, the, opposite, the opposition said that hacking would be difficult. Obviously, it would be difficult. We're not saying that once we hack, there's a, it's not going to, there is not going to be a response to that. There is going to be a response. But understand that the base on which it is being, we believe that social mobilization will always only happen when there is spread of information. And that spread of information is what we are fighting for. We believe that when there is such a spread of information, it is then that these communities start mobilizing. It is then that people understand that there are common issues that they are fighting for. Until and unless there's this information chain that happens, we believe that uh, uh, we believe that change cannot happen and therefore we again come back to these core principles and the fight that is core principles and what this debate really about. Once we say that every citizen or of every of every country has a right to live in a society that we believe offers a decent standard of living, then this choice becomes that we must actively do something to bring about those changes. And we also say that this A helps us. How? Because we understand that liberal democracy on an international stage cooperate much better than say that there is a fight between international uh, liberty, liberal and authoritarian states. Today you see Iran, China and Russia forming an axis of power and you see these other liberal democracies forming an axis of power and there is always a conflict. There is a conflict in the United Nations, there is a conflict in the in all other international organizations and therefore that always results in, in sort of uh, all sort of cooperation being withered away. You always believe that, oh, Russia always believes that every time the United States comes closer to it, oh, it's trying to change the form of government that we live. We believe that international cooperations have a much, much better uh, means of achieving their success if liberal democracies work together. And therefore, we believe that more countries should adopt these liberal democracies because we believe that world problems would be much better if cooperation exists. And therefore, these are the values and these are the principles that we fight for. And we believe this is the most cost efficient and the least sort of tampering down on the very values that we fight. For. If we uh, if we enact any other any other means, then that means then that means if the success of that means does not happen, the value gets threatened, as happens by coups and assassinations and all these other things that have been tried before. Once we lay down an overt standard and once we lay down an objective, and once we say who are these organizations, once we become transparent about our funding, a it, it makes sure that we live up to these particular standards because otherwise the world community is going to constantly mock our, our own double standards and B, it makes sure that these organizations are now no longer partisan or no longer restricted to one particular area but can actively operate and achieve these objectives wherever authoritarianism exists uh, wherever in the world and therefore we are prepared to propose. Today the previous speaker mentioned I have to call on the <laughs> 
interesting notion of axis of power that they speak of, right? Understand, right now there is huge tussle of power between a huge like the liberal states of US and UK and like the Russia and China and like the reasons a lot of countries are not moving away from IMF and moving towards the Asian Development Bank like China taking loans from China are because China provides these kinds of loans and these kinds of uh, trade without asking certain questions like freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of interaction whatever right they give these quote loans unconditionally as these do these kinds of trade unconditionally at a point of time where you as US are going to actively go and hack a uh, person like uh, countries like freedom of speech like whatever they're likely to move towards the other kind of axis that move like, like China or Russia who doesn't care about these kinds of issues right that means you're pushing away any forms of state that you probably have interaction interaction diplomatically towards the kind of countries like China who can give them refuge and protection in terms of protecting their like for authoritarian governments to continue to do whatever they want right therefore in the pretext of you helping the country you're just worsening the situation for these people because now because they are in the they are in the umbrella of China, you can't even call them out internationally and diplomatically. And be like countries like China and Russia can provide them protection in terms of cyber security or whatever they want in terms of weapons and like weapons of mass destruction to kill their citizens or whatever. Right? Therefore, in the pretext of you helping that country, you're just pushing them towards the extreme of others, like extreme like polarization towards the countries like China who actually don't care about human human like human like uh, freedoms and like you could have you could have had some sort of control over these countries in terms of like diplomatic power or trade or like loans and these are the kind of things that we want on the long run and let's see first, first i'll tell you why it won't be effective right because understand not the only thing for a revolution is just not freedom of speech right you need some sort of mechanism to overthrow the government a they're not giving you any structural reasons as to how you can overthrow authoritarian government currently because they don't want to invade that country anyway right so yeah. to who we tell you that kind of information already exists right people in authoritarian government know they're being oppressed right you don't have to give them freedom of speech to tell them that they're oppressed right they know they're oppressed right so i don't see what's the unique benefit of just giving them and seeing how can they can revolution like create a revolution on themselves to help this country Secondly, we tell you it's just they just want to clamp down hard, right? Because these kind of authoritarian governments, seeing Arab Spring and seeing other forms of countries, have already clamped down hugely on terms of cyber security, right? Therefore, even if you like probably let them like for like one year, you in your best case like let, let them like freely talk for one year, they're still going to clamp down it as soon as they find out about it, right? Therefore, at best you're going to create some sort of marginal discussion that's going to have no impact on the kind of society that's already existing, right? Because in that one year or like the small amount of time, you can't create you can't create a revolution where you can overthrow the government. You can just have some sort of discussion between these kinds of people that can have any way in underground uh, disclosures like they already do there anyway right because we don't see any unique benefit from their side and they're not given any structural mechanisms as to how any there be any concrete benefit from their side tell you it, it in fact it worsens of the situation right because these as soon as the authoritarian uh, government like people see that there are some sort of like rigging or like some sort of hacking it's easier for them to call off elections right because they say these elections are being rigged right because like these are the kind of like these are the kind of pretext that all these authoritarian uh, uh, like uh, like uh, leaders use to stop like uh, like pursuing elections right they be say they be say these elections are rigged therefore i continue my power or like let's give the power to army because the elections are being rigged right these are the kind of pretext that these authoritarian governments will use in like in, in, to justify themselves in the international forum right therefore then you can't call them out because you are being using hacking as a tool and therefore you can't call them out anymore second it's easier for them to arrest people who voice out their opinion right because now you're not just arresting for for for, for, for using clear of speech but also colluding with some foreign power uh, uh, for ut utilizing their power right therefore it's easier for them to justify arresting people who voice out their opinions using these mechanisms in the international court and these are the kind of things that worsen the situation if they want to improve it right Let's understand how diplomatic diplomatic power work, right? We understand it's a very very gradual process, right? Let's take example of China, right? Let's say US had China and like they have like couple of months of like free internet, like couple of months of like free space for people to interact, like where like, some people like some debaters and like some other people had some nuanced discussion about how we can overthrow the government, but you're not going to overthrow the government, right? and China finds out that US has hacked and therefore like clamp it down, and therefore now China is really pissed, right? And therefore they're going to stop all the diplomatic ties with the like, US has happened. Imagine if this hadn't happened, right? If this hadn't happened, like US will still export like TV shows to China, right? They still export their fashion brands to China, right? That means these are the kind of things that people watch and imbibe certain sense of freedom that is already there in US. If, I, if I'm able to watch French, if I'm able to watch two and a half men, and the kind of freedoms that exist in the society is what permeates into these kinds of people. At a point of time where these are the kind of things that wouldn't exist, right? If like US had done this before, and these are the kind of things that wouldn't exist, they wouldn't even understand what freedom of speech means or what it, what it means to have a free life. Right? These are the kind of things that soft power and 
and diplomacy actually gets you right where you can see fashion brands where you can, like where you can see understand the kind of products that exist in the society have some sort of connection with these kinds of people right these are the kind of things that are gradually helps uh, like uh, countries are assimilate into the main world to give an example of pakistan saudi arabia right? women today in saudi arabia can actually drive right these are do you think this would be possible if you were at saudi arabia before and saudi arabia shifted towards like uh, like russia and china and like stuck stuck to their own beliefs instead of actually dealing with us in oil or whatever can be kind of issue right we tell you the soft power even if it's on the long run it's a guaranteed mechanism of change that will probably exist and we think that's much much better off than isolating these countries and not using we tell you two problems with isolation right one you can't send aid like the money you spend on hacking you could probably use it for aid aid or like human rights violation or giving vaccinations these are kind of things that actually helps we have shown you that works right they are not giving any concrete proof but we are showing you that these kinds of red cross and vaccinations actually help people and therefore we are showing you a better mechanism of actually helping people if they want to right secondly we tell you in this huge value in keeping these countries into the discussion of the main forum right the reason we still give you and see to north korea is because we need them for some sort of consensus in international very like important issues like nuclear power or chemical weapons or like like yeah, yeah. Or drug dealing so whatever right? we need to have some sort of consensus with, within oh, sorry Uh, we need to have some sort of consensus on extremely important issues like 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 drug dealing or human trafficking, and these are the kind of things that once you isolate them, once you hack them, and they're going to isolate themselves from you, it's extremely hard to bring them into these kinds of discussions on international scale. Right? You know, all these things are extremely harmful. Well, like. Once, once like you isolate them. Thirdly, once they're not even responded, is how you open the Pandora's box of cyber warfare, right? Because you have justified the use of tool of cyber warfare in these kinds of countries, and that means now like China or any other country can justify in terms of using it on like US because they think their values are being hurt in the US. You're opening the huge Pandora's box of cyber warfare. Now like everyone in the world is scared, right? Like you, they don't know if like you can hack into our car and ram it into the post. They don't know when you can hack into the election grid, and like, these are the kind of things that create international like uh, international. Disturbance in the world, and this is what we're going to create. Like, we don't want to open that Pandora's box of cyber warfare because there are two things, two problems with cyber warfare. Because any non-state actor can also use it, and two, it's extremely accessible. Right? It's not like it's not like nuclear weapons where you need a lot of infrastructure for cyber warfare. Even a small country with just dedicated number of like uh, hackers can actually in, in, like uh, hack any infrastructure, like like North Korea has done. Right? Because of the ease of access of cyber warfare and because of its implementation, we tell you should not open that Pandora's box for all these reasons. Do you think the bigger is being able to speak about us to have to call on a member of government? <laughs> The standard of justice that we as the world uphold for people and citizens of the world and countries has reduced and needs to be raised, right? Which means that there has to be a change in terms of how we as liberal democracies are holding countries accountable. In in so far as to say that this should not be on conditional on what has been con like convenient to us over years, right? When we tell you that when we say that we would go ahead and fund hacking of infrastructures with limited freedom of expression, we think there's reason enough to do it. You do it so as to perform. So as to like provide a platform to people to discuss issues, for us to know the things like how people in these countries have been for so long deprived of even talking about issues that like that the government has been doing against them, or perhaps how little the government is representative of them in terms of the government taking decisions in itself, right? Which is to say that a lot of times a lot of these governments that we're talking about when we talk about authoritative regimes are not representative of the people in terms of the deals they make internationally, right? They are not representative of the people in terms of when they when they are corrupt in terms of how they are. Internally manipulating people just for like gains that they do outside it, and a lot of times why we let go of these things because we think it's convenient for us in terms of just having diplomatic ties and pushing for little things that they talk about, right? 
like when we talk about countries like when we talk about countries like say china or saudi arabia or the reason why the way these countries are able to portray themselves just like like the other tells you right that look china is going to go ahead and give easy loans and it's very easy for china to act like the big brother right and make and never come out as a country whose flaws will ever be visible to the people right because it makes us feel that when you look at these countries they have become like shady places where people can do whatever they want right in terms of like these countries becoming like the dirty laundry of the world where journalists are being beheaded right where journalists are, journalists are being assassinated for ever criticizing a government and yet we stand here celebrating mohammed bin salman for like letting women drive something that we don't think we should be celebrating like or, or like we credit saudi for that much right? please sit down like first like, if you are about to the alternatives that they provide right the alternative to tell you that look once you go ahead and have aggressive funding of hackers you will lose your ability to bargain at the un right and do it in diplomatic ways firstly bargaining at un has little to no effect when you talk about these regimes bargaining at un has not changed and has not led to an iota of change when you talk about countries like china or north korea or any other place like that right and in so far as their idea is like these countries will stop taking who and unicef aid no that does not happen they can happen which they 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 can they can happen simultaneously is like something that they can't be arguing for the other argument that they give you that this would completely lead to ir between these countries vanishing right the reason why we think that also does not happen because when you talk about international relations which exist in terms of trade these are friendships that people behold right these are things people do inherently for the kind of benefit that they seek out of this reaction which means that if there is something saudi is also getting out of the us tax and us is getting out of the saudi tax this can be a purely trade relationship which might go on to exist because the harms are equally there on both sides right but more more importantly so the extension that we no the extension that we have from our side which with something like with something like like they haven't taken cognizance of it when you tell you that there is a global impact in terms of like in terms of justice being provided we tell you that these things happen on a multifold level right when you talk about say khashoggi being assassinated in turkey you understand that the impacts of this were felt worldwide right when you talk about liberal democracies you understand that these liberal democracies are representative of the people if they like when you talk about in so far as to understand that the people in the us and the senate in the us believes that there are certain liberal values that should be upheld which means when they found out about khashoggi there was outrage in the senate where there was where there was a vote to like to ask trump to like comment on it and condemn it right which means that even trump had to go ahead and make that impact because he knew that the populace of this country was against something like this it shows that it shows that this kind of like when there is exists an ambiguity which happens on their paradigm in terms of the information that you can get out of people you also understand that you're not acting on the will of your populace in general second fall when you talk about say the russia trump deal right the reason that we know that trump probably fucked up is because we know that his lawyer gulyani went on television and made statements about like made statements about him faltering in that deal right the reason why we would never not now the reason why we would never be able to know the other side of the story because there exists a sense of ambiguity that, that when you talk about russia because simply there's no information there we think that like, we think that in so far as like the when you talk about like them being playing dirty politics and things that you things that you can never ever achieve a diplomatic outcomes happens when you know that when you do not know that why pakistan is suddenly advocating for npt probably because china has done something right we think even in the event that we allow hacking we not only provide a platform for people to talk about these issues which means these grievances are much more reflected and take global cognizance which we think is something which is far more important because it's important that we think about the people and not just leaders it but also because the kind of information that you get at this point of time is extremely useful for you for you in terms of planning your strategy like in terms of you planning your actions better right in terms of knowing that what kind of deals is probably china propagating in this area right but also in terms of planning methods which would be much more less destructive and probably better for the people right talking about the people it becomes crucial for us to understand that when you work in cooperation for this people this it's like something that they don't seem to understand when you when we say that there is a platform provision for freedom of speech we understand that in status quo there is a lack of collectivization that these people face in these countries at the point at which you work in coordination with these people you give them a platform to address grievances you offer them an opportunity to collectivize within themselves if their only idea is how would reform ever happen we think this by virtue of collectivization under a common oppression is something that leads to change and something that leads to a more local and wholesome change within this country right if they don't like they can't get away with telling that now people will say oh elections are like elections are going to be rigged and like now schools won't be built right we understand that at the point at which this this consciousness comes from within where they know that they come government has been depriving them of talking about issues we think not only are they better able to not see you as just white men who come to tame you but also in terms of 
understanding that this is a provision of them to access governmental powers which they earlier did not have right we think not only is it strategic for liberal democracies to to like ever make reform better we have also shown you how for so long we have been really shady on our idea of justice when you talk about global global powers and we think the only way that powers like china and saudi arabia can ever be made to check because there's no other mechanism you can ever check on them we think internal activism and which can only happen through collectivization which can only happen through freedom of speech is the only way to go right like things that they things that things why why o does not stand in this debate if your alternative is o ever gives you that probably the only way that these, these people will ever collectivize is by what pro, watching probably shows right we don't think things like that happen like or like or like probably like what we can alternatively do for them is build schools because that is a more direct benefit right and it's like things like this are really short lived in terms of you never needing what no, never being aware of the actual needs that these people have right for you to ever understand what these people actually need you have to break the barrier of ambiguity which only breaks when you have information about this country out there right we stand for more information very proud to propose we thank the previous speaker very much and have to call on the member of opposition Here's the problem with Gov Bench in this debate. The extent of what they tell you is two things. First is that freedom of speech is good, and second is that there's a moral obligation on liberal states to give you freedom of speech. Like, cool, we agree with that. Like, we know that that's the obligation, but neither bench is able to effectively show why hacking is the only way to get to that situation. Apart from Moji, who tries to say it in terms of other alternatives have worked, right? What we're going to do to you from exclusively from closing opposition is prove to you mechanistically why hacking is an infringement of a country's sovereignty and why that's partic particularly harmful. And second, why we give you much more comprehensive alternatives than what <laughs> OO gave you. Who just when they say that oh no, like you need better international relationships, we'll tell you as to how through our alternatives things like collectivization become better and why sustainably you uh, you create a demand for freedom of speech, right? But first, why mechanistically this uh, hacking? Undermines sovereignty, right? Because all over it was said that it would happen and that would lead to bad inter international relations, right? We think it, we think it goes far deeper than that, right? We think that mechanistically, the first reason why hacking undermines sovereignty is simply because it's shady, right? It's shady because like there are several people, there are like. Uh, because of the different conceptions of what freedom of speech is and why that's something that's problematic to different states, right? Notice that throughout this debate so far, freedom of speech is being dealt with as this monolith, right? But there are vastly different interpretations between different countries at different stages of development, right? We think even between, say, in India, which does have like things like freedom of the press, what freedom of speech means is different from like a France, right? Where they, where freedom of speech would be like competition should draw what Prophet Muhammad looks like, whereas in India it would simply be like being able to speak out against the government, right? We think simply because of crazy, incredibly different, uh, differing interpretations of what freedom of speech is, we think hacking in order to implement one is not empowering the people as they say, uh, in terms of allowing them to say what they want, but rather than imposing upon those countries with authoritarian regimes, the conception of freedom of speech that liberal countries want, right? We think particularly in that situation, so, it's a direct attack from one country to the other and not something done with the benefit of the people in mind as they characterize to it, right? We think that it undermines sovereignty, right? The second reason why it undermines sovereignty is that it isn't transparent, right? We think that in most cases, this type of hacking happens covertly, right? We think when it happens covertly, it's fundamentally different from alternatives such as sanctions, such as being able to like uh, 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 bargain with leaders simply because no one knows what's happening behind the scenes, right? We think in those situations, it's far less likely for these type of campaigns to do things like gather international support or consensus among the liberal world itself, right? Which is why we think in the cases where this takes place, it's going to be a situation where one country is directly attacking and undermining the sovereignty of the other, right? But thirdly and most importantly, we think it's disproportionate, right? Because we think that what happens as a result of hacking is that the leaders might be targeted and Western liberal countries might believe that leaders are at fault, but we think eventually the harm comes about in on the people, right? We think at best hacking happens to some extent and like countries are able to re rebuild their firewalls really quickly, right? We think what's going to happen in the interim, however, is those 
or authors or those journalists who publish articles now that they can are probably going to be the people who are hunted down and shot sure. right we think that those are the type of people who are directly harmed by the situation and they never mechanistically proved about how like suddenly everyone would like be able to gather enough mass to throw over to the government right we think on those three accounts it's an infringement of sovereignty sure. which is why it's a direct attack on people and not something that's done for like the greater good of them we, they, they they have to prove how uh, that goes up, right but more importantly moving on to alternatives that we give to you right because what we do from closing op uh, opposition is we broaden the scope of the debate right we take them at their best we think that this debate operates in like two different uh, largely two different characterizations of states right we think the first is states like china right china where like to a large extent there has been penetration of like western markets right like where you see uh, uh, like liberal american businessmen move into china where you have things like shows like friends where you have like american businesses operate fairly freely in china we think that uh, we think that these are like one set of authoritarian regimes where you have the great firewall that prevents censorship and freedom of speech right we also think that it operates in another spectrum which is like gov's best case of places like north korea right places where there's no aid no diplomacy and uh, like the only other alternative to this is war right why uh, why are there better alternatives to hacking in each of these different characteristics right first in situations like china right we think what happens in like china is that there's always the even there's first a little bit of market penetration from liberal countries but you still see that there's no collectivization for liberalization simply because the people who have who are participating in the markets of china from the liberal countries agree to censorship right we think that in china what we've seen is that firms like google firms like facebook firms like twitter have simply in order for you to gain access into the market have agreed to censor themselves to what to what the chinese government demands for it right Say the reason why, and that's the same reason why Friends, even though it airs in China, can't air any like uh, any like ideas about democracy or or why they're good, right? We think all of the uh, things that exist in status quo also agree to that censorship, right? Therefore, we think as an alternative, given that we have a motor political capital to effect some sort of change, we think that it'd be far better invested in ensuring that the firms that are participating in the markets don't agree to the censorship, right? We think we'd be we'd be happier in terms of them not being in China itself. We'd be happy with Apple not. selling iPhones to china will be happy with like google not operating uh, operating china given that they don't agree to those standards of censorship right what is the impact of this we think what happens as as a result is that because there's a demand for these products given that they're the best uh, because they're like the best in the world we think that's when there's going to be more collectivization of those people who have gotten used to those to the censored versions of those products to better affect change in terms of like you uh, know uh, in, in terms of collectivizing and asking for non censored products right we think that's when the rich elites of people who depend on facebook to connect with their american business partners right we think those are the people who are then going to start like lobbying the chinese government for creating a, a liberalization and a more sustainable conception of what freedom of speech means right that's when we think we have sustainable change right but on north korea right we think that it, we think that there are several other alternatives to hacking that exist that are more sustainable right because notice even in the best case even if you are able to hack you still need people who are there who are able to access the freedom of speech in order to say that right we think in countries with vast amounts of indoctrination like north korea this doesn't work right therefore we we propose like alternatives where like you are doing things like funding south korean groups that send balloons full of magazines with liberal propaganda into like not into like north korea right what we think that happens is that that provides direct access to people who are on the ground whether they're indoctrinated or not in order to gain access to those things right we don't necessarily think in these countries there would even be people who would write columns against the government because they're so deeply indoctrinated right we think those are structural barriers in terms of that we that we show that we prove to you are broken down apart from a principal characteristic of why this is principally disproportionate and and uh, unjustified for those reasons proud to this We think the previous speaker mentioned the hacking call on the government whip.
क्लोजिंग ऑपोजिशन कहते हुए विद स्लाइमी ऑल्टरनेटिव लाइक दिस इज मोट लाइक एपल सेल आई फोन टू चाइना एंड सामली दैट विल मेक लाइक पीपल एंड बिजनेस मैन इन चाइना कलेक्टिवाइज बिकॉज दैट्स द रीजन वाई दे विल कलेक्टिवाइज वर्सेज देर नॉट अग्रीन दैट लाइक क्रिटिकल इन्फॉर्मेशन अबाउट द गवर्मेंट विच पीपल हैव नेवर रियली हैड इन द पास इज नॉट रियली समथिंग विच पीपल विल कलेक्टिवाइज ओवर लाइक पीपल डील विद दैट बेस्ट केस वाई दीज गवर्मेंट्स क्लैम डाउन ऑन आस और लाइक क्लैम डाउन ऑन ऑन दीज लाइक फॉरम्स आफ्टर सम टाइम एंड वील टेल यू वाई इवन इन दैट केस इट इज बेटर फॉर आस टू डू दिस वर्स इज वॉट वी आर डूइंग करेंटली लाइक based on what closing opposition themselves say in terms of how censors censorship is something which all of us have agreed in terms of like businesses which us does in china being like censored by the government this also like flows down to the type of policies that we have with them or the things that we don't really talk about with like these countries because we feel like it's okay to just not go into that gray zone and just deal with them on a business and a transactional level as long as we are being benefited right recently we figured out we found out how this is this could be like detrimental for us too when like our citizens go to these countries and who aren't really safe in the hands of these in the hands of these leaders of these states right which means that the the general like general standard for justice for these nations have always been one which has been like lesser compared to what how we like hold other countries accountable right i will explain to you why they're clamping down back on usa is not really going to be that problematic to us because like the amount of transparency which we have compared to what they do is not really like comparable right this means that usa can like be like prepared for hacks on president trump because there is a probability that that's already happening through the journalistic methods that exist within the ambit of those nations itself right the reason why it's unique to authoritarian regimes and like let's not like let's like let's not and like let's not just take closing opposition side of is in freedom of speech is like very subjective these are authoritarian regimes right which means that there is importance to us to like understanding what what this means in terms of freedom of speech being one where these governments clamp down on any sort of any sort of critique of them amongst the public right which means they can't really get away with the idea that we we will talk to them in un and that will solve our problems right i'll explain to you why even that is not something that we have done till now why there is never really any incentive to do that on on a global platform like right? this um so the first idea of by international relations and like diplomatic like talks is not really like good enough for us to do this right like opening opposition told you china and other countries and russia and uh, like saudi arabia etc have a clout amongst these regions because of how they, they have become these leaders where anything where they could get anything done right which means that their ability to like have transactions with other countries or have shady deals with countries which which are in trouble like pakistan etc becomes a lot more under status quo because there is never really any dirty laundry about them or the way they like treat their citizens in the global in the global uh, arena right which means that it becomes Easier for us to like just target Pakistan, but China always comes and protects it, right? Which means that only way to like stop this from happening and ensure that the standard for justice is not one where we shy away from discussions is when we have some sort of legitimate information about these countries, and that can only happen when you involve the public in the process, right? What is the problem with the current methods of doing this? Journalists or like any other people who try to do this have their lives endangered because of the way these countries function, right? We don't think that the way we do this is not also like. Let's just understand that if you are going to provide them the freedom of speech, we are obviously going to ensure that the people who are like telling us this information are protected in the way that this is not really like telling them where they live or what their names are. But the information in itself is critical, and that doesn't exist under status quo, right? Which means that all of their all of their arguments till now have been straw man at best, and not really ones where they provide you credible arguments in terms of why these countries would be able to like change in the long term, right? We tell you why that when you don't have diplomatic ties working for you, or when you when you have this cloud which these countries have in global forums, the only way to like negotiate with them becomes when you have some sort of credible information which you could which that could that could help you, right? Which means even in the best case of like one month, we still have the ability to talk to people in these nations who have critical information, say like about Kashmir or about like China's deals with Pakistan or like etc. And that that information in itself is critical for us. And even though we cannot get it for a long term, that information in itself. could mean a lot in terms of bettering the di- diplomatic ties which we have under status quo right the reason why countries can't just like cut ties like off just like that and like live in separate corners is because there is some amount of dependency which exists in terms of finance in the global world right which means that obviously even in this scenario even after all of this china still needs usa the way usa needs china saudi arabia still needs usa the way the way usa needs saudi arabia which means that these ties may reduce in number or you might face some losses in the short term but these these, these are right, exactly replaceable which means that is it exactly an argument which will stand in the long term because the because of how mutually exclusive mutually inclusive the uh, the losses are on both sides right okay. go
when when the USA acts, let's say Zimbabwe, where do you think Zimbabwe is likely to move towards? Either towards diplomacy towards China or diplomacy towards USA? See, let me tell you that obviously that currently this is a problem and we and we tell you that it is a problem, right? We believe that the only way you can you can attract like smaller nations which have problems with USA or, or smaller nations which like say have terrorists in, inside their like countries' borders, etc., and don't really want and you have a problem against them, etc. The only way to like stop these deals between these countries to happen is when you make sure that China doesn't really look that that favor, favorable and actor as it does under status quo, right? And that can only happen when you clamp when you clamp down on its citizens and understand and, and when you go to citizens and understand what what they what the information that they have or the information which is unique to just that region, which we can't get any through any other means, right? Which means that in this debate we need to understand that these guys obviously this is going to happen in a long term in terms of these countries like having to understand that even China isn't that favorable and actor, right? Which means that in the global forum for China to ever really stand relevant it needs to defend itself against these info against this information right under status quo the burden to find information towards these nations lies on like individual journalists or lies on like people in these nations both of these actors are aren't exactly like protected by these states right we believe that given that liberal states have a certain amount of money and certain amount of clout we are at a better position to enforce these things and that is the reason why we should do this right it is not just a moral moral responsibility like they say that that that's 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 not the only reason, but also that we might be the only, only this might be the only way that we could ever have anything against these countries, and only way that we could ever really change things in the long term, right? Because we are the only side which proves to you how like this this like method happens in terms of how why is why is it important that we go ahead and break the ties between like countries like China and smaller nations which are now like joining into the club? Why it is harder? Why there should be a like standard for justice in the world and not just like, shy away from discussions in the name of diplomatic ties vanishing away. It is extremely important that we understand that we as liberal nations have a certain amount of responsibility towards these people and towards our own citizens who are being endangered in, in our efforts to just look like palatable to these nations. Extremely proud. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. concede that freedom of speech is important. Then the question in this debate and the metric to judge it becomes on whose side is the best form of freedom of speech given to the people. We on closing opposition tell you that it is one driven by the people and one which is sustained. And I'm going to go on and prove that in my speech. So before that, a few responses. Firstly, to opening government, right? So they have one argument. They said that once you employ these tactics, tactics leader will, leaders will engage and then yay democracy, right? That is the extent of analysis they've given you. Firstly, there are two possible reactions to this. One, that the leaders spin this rhetoric and people do not buy it. In that event, it's not a democracy and people won't actually, uh, uh, won't actually buy this. And we have seen that in some authoritarian regimes, the, uh, the leaders do have a large, large amount of social capital. And secondly, which is their best case, they don't actually spin this narrative. People are angry and they do buy this and revolt, right? At that point, the government isn't going to be like, oh, okay, fine, I'll listen to you, right? Authoritarian regimes function on consolidating their power. Any counter narrative is a threat to power and they will necessarily quell it. The only engagement that governments are going to do with people is in terms of shooting them and throwing journalists into jail. So we don't really think that's possible. Again, even if that doesn't happen, they're simply going to quell protests in say a non-violent form in their best case again. And they still aren't liberated on our side because this freedom of speech is not sustained. It, it's like a short burst but, uh, where this freedom of speech is going to be taken back away as I've told you because there is a threat of power and it, this short burst of freedom of speech is not particularly important when the trade-off might be violence and further quelling of dissent. We don't see how any change accrues on their side of the house. Now responding to CG, right? They tell, they like, they, they tell you and their only extension is marginally prove how it might be more mechanistic. 
all of this is again contingent on sustained information right that this freedom of speech once it occurs will continue to happen and the government is going to do nothing about it completely unengaging with like op bench as a whole right we don't think it's going to be sustained and leaders do have an incentive to quell this as well right especially specifically when like akash has described to you why hacking specifically is a violation of sovereignty because international support doesn't exist like all their mechanisms of hey we're going to open up discussion people will be able to collectivize and eventually protests are going to be formed is contingent on sustained freedom of speech and sustained freedom of speech will only happen at the point at which the government does nothing in that scenario i don't see why an authoritarian government will do nothing their mechanism of change does not stand what government with does for us is that a concede that there is some amount of financial cross pollination that occurs to be in terms of markets penetrating in terms of markets penetrating china and people consuming products and actually a demand for these products being there so the question at this point becomes would you uh would you not would you rather not set like not allow these businesses to set up while they censor themselves in this scenario you don't have to be an evil actor or would you actually go ahead and hack infringe sovereignty right now answering the uh, uh, answering those questions and here's how we differentiate ourselves from oppo firstly they uh, like we are the team that has given you exclusive analysis as to why hacking particularly is an infringement of sovereignty we told you that it happens discreetly and there are multiple definitions of freedom of sovereignty right like oh's argument of this legitimizes hacking and hence uh, it leads to bad international relations only stands if they prove to you why hacking is different from traditional forms such as intervention right infringement uh, in intervention as well is an infringement of sovereignty so i don't see why international relations will not be lost on their side of the house we've given you unique analysis as to why hacking is particularly problematic in akash speech no said so like moving on to a more important extension that was completely unresponded to and sort of conceded to right like how do we implement change on our side what we tell you is that we argue for uh, places like china uh, like china and we tell you that the alternative is to prevent companies like twitter facebook and google from setting up shop in china or withdrawing uh, their uh, withdrawing their uh, the, their their already set up companies here right why we, why we will be able to regulate them because this debate automatically assumes that there is some amount of funding so with that funding you can probably give them tax breaks and additionally these companies are based uh, are based in these liberal states right and they do have a large amount of bargaining power with these tech, tech companies in the first place so we do think regulation is possible sure and prior to the existence of technology and prior to the existence of these big multinational corporations were there no authoritarian governments yeah okay but this debate is happening today right i'm not rewinding back to 1800s and be like yeah that is where we need to like have dissent no sit so um, yeah and like specific that's our extension right social media is particularly relevant today so leverage it so um, yeah so why why do we think collectivization is better on our side of the house right as we said they a uh, cg tells you that collectivization will happen because the uh, uh, the questionable information is being leaked again that's not the, again their uh, collectivization is pretty floppy because that narrative can be spun and it's not sustained we think the demand for these products and services is extremely popular simply because these are the best and these are consumed by by like almost the entire population of china and cross pollination does exist so there is a massive demand so what happens at the point at which uh, you will you withdraw support you, you, the, uh, these companies withdraw support we think there will be collectivization on a massive scale simply because of this demand uh, and that's the best form of collectivization right why why our alternative is better on their side freedom of speech is guaranteed to people when a liberal democracy see whatever the liberal democracy feels like right oh america needs oil so america decides okay fine let me give them some amount of freedom of speech that's absolutely abhorrent and the freedom of speech cannot be contingent on this on our side of the house freedom of 
speech is driven by people's demand in the sense it's going it's going to be the best form of freedom of speech and it will be it will be sustained right and because of the massive amount of support and demand for this we think even authoritarian governments have an incentive because everyone uses these products and everyone needs them they're the best in the world so we've proved to you that uh, like we'll only let facebook operate once they allow like uh, dissent uh, once they allow chinese people to talk about dissent within these countries and this dissent is going to be driven by the people not some west not like something that's seen acceptable by the western leader and not something that can be spun in multiple ways that is when it is sustained because people demand it and demand sustains these things that's when discussion activism collectivization is best proud to oppose Thank you very much.